Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So glad you are with us today on this beautiful spring day. Yesterday was the first day of spring. It's Sunday. Yes. Kind of a big day in the life of St. Andrew. I hope that you uh, uh, either attended 5.30 or 9.30 this morning and um, heard Arthur and heard Robert, and it's just kind of a big day. It's, you know, it's, it's not, not, I think for most of us, it's not a big surprise. But the really good news is that Robert is coming back, and he's yes. going to be founding pastor and work of like our age, of, yeah, of the like older, you know, yeah, retiring yeah. and those who might be thinking about retiring age. So I think that's so just really wonderful. it's just good, 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 good all good, around, good, good, and good. I'm very excited about it. And you know, if you know me, you know that I've been a fan of Arthur's for a very long time, pretty much since that young whippersnapper first yes. showed up at the door. <laughs> we discovered yes. that we were very simpatico. I was so. asked, "Is is what does Scott think?" I'm like, Scott couldn't be happier. Yeah, because, I mean, Arthur, you know, <laughs> you know, Arthur, he's a known commodity, and he's, he's great. a known person, and he's wonderful, he's, and yes, great, he's great wonderful. heart, and great mind, and great heart wife, for God, and great wife, great wife and, and kids, so, good guy. Yeah, so we're cool. very excited. It is cool. So uh, we hope more you guys excitement in the life of Saint Andrew. Yeah, but this is big, big, big. Um, it is. I it mean, is big. I try to think of like the other days, and it would be like maybe when we had um, decided to build a new sanctuary and things like that. But this in is, a lot of ways, it's kind of like one of the biggest days because Robert's been. I mean, you know, Robert wanted the church, wanted the next senior pastor of the church to be somebody that would he was confident would really serve God and yes. be grace filled and and grow the church and really. Yes. And Robert has got that in Arthur. That's right. And so it's that's it's, right. It's wonderful. And you got a preaching buddy, the du the tag team, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, mag tag team yes. the magnificent tag team. Yes. So um, yeah, and Arthur's already got Scott slated to preach a whole bunch this summer. So um, that's all good. It's exciting. So, hey, everybody's going to be excited, honey, to have okay. you back there. Okay. So, um, anyway, it's gorgeous out. I hope you get to be out a little. We we actually went out on Friday and Saturday for just a little bit, but it was so nice just to be outside and. Yeah, we yes, did. Got was... to be with people we love. Got to eat meals on lunch on Friday and and um, let dinner last night. So, all good. Yep, it's all good. Things are happening. Yes, we're grateful for that. So we are grateful that all of you all are here today yes, on this we are. on this Sunday morning. We sure we're are. We're going to spend some time talking about God's words again today. So, would you pray with me, please? Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be gathered here. We know that you have called us here. We are know that we know that we are part of the communion the communion of saints, the the church, this worldwide universal body of Christ and we are grateful for your call and we are grateful that we can gather like this on a Sunday morning and just take time out of our week to to rest ourselves in thoughts of you and to contemplate um, what it is that you have really done for us and who you really are and and how we can be grateful to you for all that you have given us all this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. You so know the word is... that really sticks out to me this morning in What's Arthur's uh, sermon was grace. Oh, well, he said grace, it about a hundred times grace. because see, see, this is what I like about Arthur. Arthur gets it. What in the world out there, in sort of the secular world, the larger American society, what is most missing in this world today is grace. It is. This is. You know, just like, where did it go? Where did compassion and forgiveness and stuff really go? It's it's um, just, just a lot of meanness out there. And um, so anyway, but I'm not going to wax on about that kind of thing. We are here to talk about God's words. And I have a couple of announcements um, first. So uh, in the past few couple of weeks ago, we took a few Sundays and did a sort of fill the basket thing. And y'all were very generous. You gave $5,490 just to fill up the Missions Committee's bas basket so they have money to work with to meet immediate needs. So, wow, wow. Again, y'all are such a generous bunch, and we are we are just deeply, I'm deep, I'm always touched by it. I know Rich and the committee appreciate this, and 
and your support of what the class does. As I've said many times, our class missions collection um, is really pretty much the largest in the church outside the big special collections and stuff that we do as a congregation sometimes. So it's really just, just a tremendous work that y'all do. And secondly, I heard from Peggy Samford this week. She reminded me that the St. Andrew UMW is doing two fundraisers. You can tell things are getting back to normal. We got two fundraisers, one built around nothing bunt cakes. <laughs> I love those things. Awesome. And they're awesome. And the other one around honey baked hams. And I love those as well. So I'm on this slide, um, I've showed you how to get there. Just go to the church website, click on news. Um, if you just go to the church, church, the opening page of the church website, news is over on the right hand side. Just click on news, scroll a little bit down the page. You'll see both of these. Click on them. And it'll take you to what you need to know and how this is going to work. So um, I, I invite you to participate. They will appreciate your support for that. Um, Absolutely. Sounds like a great Easter meal, doesn't it? Honey baked ham and then the bundt cakes for dessert. Yes, it does. Yes. A pretty much unbeatable combo. <laughs> I particularly like the little lemon bundt cakes. I don't know why. So the little lemon good. ones. I was up there at their store one day, and they had free samples. And uh, anyway, we, well, I won't get into that either. How many free samples? Yeah, I don't know. Finally, <laughs> kick you out of the store. I think they had to lock the door to get <laughs> keep me out of there. <laughs> okay, so we are here to talk about God's words again today, and we've been doing this, and I think it's been a very helpful discussion. I've gotten good feedback from people about this series, um, and I think we will just keep. Just keep marching on. So let's talk about schedule before I, while well, that's on my mind. Okay, so today is March 21st. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. We will have class next Sunday on Palm Sunday. The next Sunday, two weeks from today, is Easter. We will not have class on Easter because Patty and I, for one, we are going to go out to the ballpark. So um, it's going to be the, you, I'm sure you're aware that we're doing Easter at the Rangers ballpark this year. We can all Rough come Riders. there. What did I say? Rangers. Oh, big mistake. Back like up. Rangers and back training. up, back up, back up, back up. The Rough Riders Stadium in Frisco. Dr. Pepper Park, I think I call it the Rough Riders Stadium in Frisco. That's where it is. And the service times are all out there and published if you have questions. Go to the St. Andrew website, but that's what we're all doing, and so it's going to be awesome to see everybody, and that's happening in two weeks on Easter. And then we will have two weeks of class, and then on April 25th, I am preaching at 5.30, I am preaching at 9.30, and I am preaching at 11 o'clock a.m. on 1 Corinthians 15. Arthur was right when he called and asked me to do this. I sort of said, oh yeah, man, I'm your guy for that. So... Anyway, we're going to, I'm going to get to talk about resurrection, and he's even giving me more time. So I've got like, i got a, block, a sermon block that's like 30 or 35 minutes long. Wow. Isn't that something? That's cool. In, in the services. So it'll be all three of them. So I know y'all will, uh, many of you will, could have probably anticipate the things I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to get to do it at the 11 o'clock service. And those people never heard me do any of it. <laughs> so that's going to be fun going to be fun. All right, so got anything over there before we plunge into today's words, Patty? Um, the only thing, we, we had a really nice joy there from Mike and Beth Kelly that they're That's right, I saw that. I it flashed in my mind. Just flat. Yeah, they're going to have their first grandchild, and it's a boy from Mike and Beth Kelly. That is a big deal. That is a big deal. I've been there. That's a, that, that is a big deal. So. And we also know that Susan Morgan's, whose knee surgery was Friday, all turned out that well. And went she well. has to now go through the healing and all of that. And so we are so grateful for prayers answered on that one, too. Yes, we are. Indeed, we are. So, okay. Well, God's words. We've talked about the cluster of words around holy and sanctify, consecrate, sanctuary, um, we have talked about the cluster of words around the church, the body of Christ, the people of God, the people of God, the communion of saints, the fellowship that is the church. Um, and 
Last week we talked about grace, and we talked about grace from a couple of directions, and, you know, um, I was just so, as I said a moment ago, I was so grateful that Arthur wanted to talk so much about grace today, because that really is, you know, um, that's really where it should begin with us. We, we are called to be people of grace in reflection of the fact that God has poured out so much grace upon us. So today, I want to come to this cluster of words. Many of you probably know this. Um, as I always say, if you're going to tell me, Scott, I've heard this, I'm going to ask you, can you explain it to somebody else? Could you explain it to your kids, friends? family, whatever. If you feel like you can, you are in good shape. But explaining is sometimes a little more difficult than hearing. So here it is. These four words, Mashiach, Messiah, Christos, Christ, they are all the same word. They're all the same word in one, two, three, four different languages. So let's start at the top. The word comes from, that's the Hebrew, okay, obviously in the, you know, English characters, but that's uh, Latin characters. Mashiach, it means anointed one. That's what it means. It means the anointed one, somebody who's been anointed. That's all it means. You can be, it might, might be anointed, the, you know, the club president of your local book club or something, but Mashiach means anointed one. Now, it came to have a connotation in Israel among the Hebrews of royalty. Why? Because the kings were anointed. So it became, Mashiach was like capital A, capital O, the anointed one, the king. There were prophets who were anointed, but it really took on this meaning of, of um, an anointed one. And when Israel fell into oppression by pagans, they began to anticipate the arrival of an anointed one, an anointed one um, from the line of David, a rightful king, a rightful anointed one in the line of David who was the great idealized king, the great idealized anointed one of Israel. And so they looked forward to the arrival of God's Messiah. And that word Mashiach comes into English very straightforwardly as Messiah. You can see that, right? Messiah is simply the English, um, almost a transliteration of, of Mashiach. Messiah, the anointed one, the king. It's a royal idea. Um, Messiah is to claim, to call Jesus Messiah is to call him king of the Jews. Yes, it is. That's the irony of the sign on Jesus' cross. It said King of the Jews. It was ironic because the Romans meant it as a term of derision, but as did the Jewish priests, but it was true. He is Messiah. He is the King of the Jews. Now, your New Testament is written in Greek, not in Hebrew, right? There is an Old Testament translation from the Hebrew into the Greek called the Septuagint. In the Greek, when you would come across the word Mashiach, it would be translated to the Greek equivalent of anointed one, which is simply Christos. That's Greek, the Greek word for the anointed one. So it means exactly the same thing. And then when it comes into English, Christos in the Greek becomes Christ in English. So Messiah and Christ are absolute, absolute synonyms. They are two ways of writing the same idea. Messiah and Christ. And, and Christ is not a name. It is a title, just as Messiah is a title. And, and if we can understand this in your New Testament, that, that Messiah slash Christ is a title conferred upon the royal one, the anointed one, um, uh, lifted up by God to be king of the Jews, then you've got a lot of the New Testament ideas right in your head. When Peter turns 
when Jesus turns to Peter and says, well, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. This slide is what he has in mind. Okay? The royal one, the anointed one. Now, got to get the next thing straight. This is, this is more challenging. For first century Jews, the idea Messiah and the idea God are completely separate. Completely and utterly separate. I'm going to, I'm waving my hands here. They're completely and utterly separate. They were radically monotheistic. There is God. And their expectation was that God would one day raise up someone to be the Messiah, to be the anointed one of Israel. One from the line of David. David wasn't God. None of the kings of Israel were God. There wasn't an expect... None of the human kings of Israel were God. So... The fact that in Jesus, the two collapse into one, because Jesus is both God and Messiah, that doesn't mean that's how you should read the Gospels. In the Gospels, keep them apart. When, Peter's, when Jesus says, Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. There's no sense, no sense in Peter that he thinks Jesus is God. That would, that would come later. So in your Gospels, just keep the two categories separate and you will read your Gospel better. You'll understand it better. So, cool. Anything about all that? These seem like simple things, but I'm t I was reflecting on this this morning because I, I was ended up thinking about this sermon I have coming on April 25th about resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. There's a whole bunch of really important stuff that nobody ever told me. I had gone to church my whole life. When I was 50 years old, I'd been a Methodist for since I was 20, and then I was raised in the Episcopal Church. I was an altar boy. I mean, and in the Episcopal Church, that's a serious job. You for got five minutes, you were a Mormon. Uh, for five minutes, I was a Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> so, but nobody ever explained any of this to me, and. My experience over the last 20 years is that when I meet other people, they they all agree, well, nobody explained this stuff to us either. I don't know why people haven't had this explained to them, but boy, does it help. You read your, actually read your New Testament. Actually read your Bible and have it make sense to you. So you read it and you say, oh, I know what's going on here. Look at that, yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, enough of that. So now we're going to go on to the next word group, and we're going to be here a pretty good while. This is such a big word, righteous and righteousness. It's all over the Bible from beginning to end. Um, uh, famous verse, Genesis 15, says Abraham um, trusted God, he believed in God, he faithed in God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Um, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, uh, Paul writes, the gospel, the good news, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God. We talk about, we, 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 God calls us to be righteous. What does that mean? So there's a lot of uses. There's it's, but it's a big, 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 important word. So, um, let me go back to my little handy slides here. Okay, so, for, for God, holiness, if, we, if you could think back to when I was talking about holiness a couple weeks ago, righteousness is a key aspect of holiness. Okay, um, and it doesn't. It's not all of the word holy. There's a lot. There's more to the word holy than righteousness, but it's a key aspect. Okay, and there are two central concepts bound up in the biblical notion of what righteousness is. What do we mean when we use the word righteousness? 
The first is pretty straightforward. And it's kind of, it is kind of a legal idea. Um, and that's why the word righteousness or something we'll talk about in a minute, justify, show up in a lot of legal contexts, particularly in Paul, because it is doing what is right. To be righteous is to do what is right. Do what is just. Um, and it includes being vindicated or being found innocent before a judge. And so in Paul, you will find him, which we're going to talk about this in a minute, but you will talk, find him talking about our having been righteous, our having been justified. And that is in a legal sense, and it really is in a sense of having been declared innocent. How is it we declared innocent? Because, you know, because of Jesus' victory over sin and death, and, and that being our own victory over sin and death. But that's the first idea. Um, it's kind of the way we use the word a lot, I think, in life. Um, righteous is doing right. It is doing what is just. Um, uh, a person who, and we have courts in this country. Every day people are found to be in the right. Who's found to be in the right? The innocent party. The party is not guilty. But there's another meaning in the Bible, another way the word is used in the Bible that I think will make a lot of sense to you. It is being faithful to the demands of a relationship. As in, big phrase here, God's covenant faithfulness. So it's in a relational sense. Um, uh, God made promises, and in Christ, God kept those promises. God was righteous. He is not only the great promise maker, but he is the great promise keeper. Even if the price of that promise keeping is the death of his own son on a cross. It's a relational idea. It's I when I come to this, my mind always goes to the to the to the um, or a parable of the prodigal son where the father is faithful to his son despite his son's unfaithfulness, right? The father, when the son comes home, the father being the father um, uh, wants to be faithful and he runs down and grabs up the son and hugs him and forgives him and, and all that kind of thing. It's a real relational way of thinking about thinking about salvation. So righteousness really is an expression of God's character. So you're going to say, "Bill well, Scott, well, what's right? What is just? Right? We live in a we live in a culture which asks those questions all the time. What's right? What's just? What should we do?" Our answer begins with God, and God has revealed Himself in the pages of Scripture. So hence. <laughs> Our answer to the question is what is right, what is just, begins with Scripture. And, and of course, it comes from thousands of years ago. We live in a world where we have mRNA vaccines to treat, you know, a coronavirus and all other kinds of capabilities and questions and so forth. And so we can't always, we'd always find a straightforward answer in the Bible where it says, well, like, when you develop an uh, mRNA, whatever. Of course not. But in there, we can find the principles. We can find the essence of God's character. We can find enough examples to guide us in knowing what is right and what is just. Sort of foundational principles. Um, okay? Um, even Thomas Jefferson saw this in the Declaration of Independence. What did he write? You know, that we have these, these fundamental, fundamental, essential rights given us by God. The right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay? That, that, that these are just sort of fundamental to what it means to be human. They're fundamental to what is revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. So... That's why 
the more that you the more that you leave behind the revealed truth of God in scripture the more difficult it becomes to know what is right and what is just because it just becomes everybody's opinion and that quickly morphs into the opinions which hold sway are the opinions of the powerful and that's what happens that's where that road ends so you know but god has revealed to us what is right and what is just and and it's uh, maybe maybe the biggest reason we come to scripture is not to hear about ourselves but it's come we come to the pages of scripture to understand who god is and to come to understand what God's character is. And so, even in the Law of Moses from more than three millennia ago, we can learn a lot about what is righteous. And all the little case law, we're doing this in my Monday afternoon class, we're doing Exodus, and we were in like an Exodus 21, 22 right now. And these are a few chapters right there in Exodus which have like Hebrew case law. You know, you're your neighbor's oxen falls in a hole that you dug. What do y'all do? What's fair? What's just? And it's kind of surprising the amount of detail that's there. And so far, by and large, as weird as it sometimes is, it seems balancing interests, taking into account negligence and all the rest of it. I think it's like all there. Right, Patty? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of it's kind of kind of a wild, I, I think, in a way. Okay, so I have a question. Oh, please go ahead, Patty, because <laughs> I'm just rambling on. No, no, you're everything. See, is when right. we, when you when you're meeting in person, you can sort of read the room, you right. know, and you can sort of see what's a good time to stop and, but online well, it's harder. I've got actually two questions. Okay, and um, I'm hoping other people are maybe thinking what I'm thinking. Guarantee you, there are. <laughs> okay. I've done this a long time. So we do pray all the time and in our prayers to God to yes. help us to be more Christ-like. Yes. Because it is a process. It's not something, mm. boy, I sure hope that nobody thinks they just, all of a sudden, they're Christ-like, right? I mean, it is a process. And I know John Wesley had a, his goal was sort of to reach that. And many of us, it seems like it's unreachable, but... We're working. We're working in that way. So is righteousness or being righteous, that is also a process, right? This is nothing that somebody could wake up one morning and say, today, I hope that I become righteous. Or You are 100% right. So the first slide on righteousness at the top, I titled it, holiness is righteousness. They're bound up together. So if we go back to a couple weeks ago when we talked about the word sanctify, which means to be made holy. And we said, well, in the Bible, there is the sense that we have been made holy. It's a state. And there is this sense that we are being sanctified. That sanctification is something that we and the Holy Spirit... Will you turn on your mic? They can't hear me. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I, I, I think... The mic is on. Okay, hang on. I, I don't know. I think you're going to have to, have to speak up, Betty, because okay. I don't think anything is. Okay. Hang on one I second. I know sometimes when you do your podcast, it's on a Yeah, but you know it's back. Okay, I'll talk I about think it. you just need to speak up. Okay. There, I'll shove it more in your direction because I'm a loud mouth, so it's not a problem picking me up. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> Okay, so yes, being, we are in the process of becoming more righteous. We are in the process of becoming sanctified. We are in the process of becoming holy. And it is a process that takes a lifetime, right? Right. Right, some of the, and, and so Christ-like is a good shorthand word for becoming more holy, becoming more righteous, becoming more, becoming sanctified, becoming more Christ-like also conveys a process. And of course, Jesus was holy, righteous, and the rest. So 
being becoming Christ-like in our grace and compassion and kindness in our understanding of what is right and what is just. Right? You can lump all that all that in there together. Yes, that is the way to think about it. So it's not a switch you're going to turn on in your daily life. And there are people, I think, who kind of think that because they think, I've been saved. I've been saved. And they go back to their old lives as if nothing needs to change from that point on. And that is that is just not biblical in any sense of the word. Okay, so one my part two, of, thank you for that. My part two of the question is, um, we did already go through sanctify uh, last week or the week before. Um, and sanctifying is being made holy. So, can the two words, becoming righteous and becoming sanctified, can they be interchanged for each other? Or, can you explain what the difference is? E in an easy layman's terms that Patty will understand. Okay, and let me check one other thing about this mic thing. It, it's oh, I, I see it. I see what the problem is. The, the um. Most people said they can hear me though. Fine. So. I okay. Can... Yes. No, we're on the right mic. Okay. I was thought maybe cool. it had switched to a yeah, different mic somewhere. So okay. I think we're okay. We're we're doing the best we can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all, we'll only go that far. We're not saying we've got it. We're just going the best we can. We're okay. In, we're in a process. Sanctify is really the larger word, because sanctify means to be made holy, and holy is the big word. Okay, and there are a lot of things that are captured in that word holy. One of the key ones is to be righteous to do right, to, to, to do what is just. So, so righteousness in that sense is, is, um, is part of what it means to be sanctified. It would be a bullet sanctified. point under sanctified? It might be a bullet point. Okay. But, yes. But if you really, yes, that, Yes, that's how I that I think that is probably the neatest way to 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 think about it. They do get all kind of mixed up, and you try to pull them apart. And guess what? They're kind of hard to pull apart because there is one God, there's one Patty, there's one Scott. So, you know, I'd clone you if I could. <laughs> <laughs> you probably. I hope you didn't hear that. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yes. Okay. Okay. Kind of. Maybe skip a beat here, dear. Okay, very funny. Oh, well, my other part was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this was going to be my joke. <clears throat> so where do you think the Righteous Brothers got their name from? <laughs> Did they think they had already been made holy or what? Ah, but you see, oh, now wait a minute. Okay. You, you have been made holy. See, this is this already not yet thing. And it's almost like we need to start a... <laughs> The ideas I get sometimes frighten me. It's like we need to start a club, right? We need a club, and we all need to be in this club, and we're gonna, all of us are going to work to train each other. Okay? So we use the language right. So you, Is this so like you can't... Is these holy clubs? Well, it might of? be. You can't say, well, I have, I, I, I have, I'm, I, I'm not holy. You, you have, you are holy. You have been made holy. And you are being made holy. Both things are true. Both things are true. In practice, we have to realize the processes there. So Paul will say, Paul will say weird things. He'll say like, this sometimes freaks people. I will say, you know, work out your salvation. Right? Because we want to think everything is an instant Right, we've already but, been but saved. It's, but, but we are we have been saved and we are being saved. We have been made holy, we are being made holy. Both are true. And the reason you have to lift both up is because otherwise you end up having to take a scissors, pair of scissors to the New Testament. Because there's lots of stuff that says you have been made holy. And there's lots of stuff that says you are being made holy. That would be one of the I'm kind realizing of statements I'm sticking that, my hands up right here in the <laughs> camera. That you would say you know, you, yes, you have already been made righteous or sanctified or made holy. Now act like it. That's the old, that's the silly. I'm not going to mention your mother because people yes, are I going know. to okay. scream if they hear your yes, mother I know. said that but one more time. But you know it's true. 
I do know it's true. That it's is a true. good it's a good teaching okay. metaphor, analogy. You're seventeen, Scott, act like it. Okay. It's a, it's, At least it, we've made our way up from fifteen now, so that's good. <laughs> She probably said that to me a couple of years before she passed, I'm guessing. <laughs> Scott, you're 65 now. Will you act like it? Okay, okay. So, anyway. Okay. Very good. So, it's righteousness is an expression of God's character. And it is God's standard for God's people. We are called to be a holy people and thus we are called to be a righteous people. We simply are. I've, I've got, um, I may have mentioned this, you know, I've got another book that is a collection of my writings coming out in June, I think, and, and we kind of worked through the title, and I didn't want the title to be what Jesus asks of us. And I didn't want the title to be what Jesus requires of us because asking is too soft, requiring is too hard and legalistic. Instead, Nancy Karkowski had the right title in mind. It's your book. <laughs> that what Jesus expects of us. And I think that is exactly in the right place. God does expect his people to be a holy people, to be a righteous people, to seek to do right in every circumstances, to seek justice. You know, um, uh, I read, read a, an interview with Esau Macaulay, this young, I don't know how young he is, right? But younger than me, for sure. <laughs> Black theologian at Wheaton College and with uh, David Brooks at the New York Times. And and they got to talking about racism and justice and stuff. And, of course, Esau Macaulay, grounding himself in Scripture, started at the right place. That racism is a sin. It can be a collective sin. Just as the Israelites were often committed a collective sins. The, the people coming together to build a golden calf is a collective sin. There are other collective sins that we do as 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 a group of people and so that we are called to leave that behind and to overcome that and to be a holy people sanctified doing what is right doing what is just seeking justice dispensing mercy being grace-filled that's what we, that's what Jesus expects of us. And I don't think the expectational language is, is, is anything to be frightened of. It's, it's, it's New Testament. It's what Paul expects of the churches that he's founding. He's going to help them and he's going to, going to give them lots of, of ways to, to progress, but it's clear it's what he expects of them. I mean, he sometimes grabs them by the lapel of their coats, metaphorically, to shake them and say, you know, come on, what are you doing? You know, don't you care that that dude is having sex with his mother-in-law? Come on. First Corinthians 5, I think. So, expectations. So, yes, God expects us to be a righteous people, a holy people. So, all right. So are we cool? We, we we've kind of talked about this enough. You think for a moment, Patty? Because now we're gonna we're not, now we're gonna make this more difficult, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about the left about the about the curveball that the New Testament throws at us, and it's a language problem. We're gonna talk about the word justify and the word justification. If you spend time around Methodists or other Protestants, they'll often end up talking about justifying grace. As I said last week, it isn't like it's a different substance of grace. It's describing grace used in a different circumstance. And the circumstance for justifying grace is kind of in the courtroom idea, kind of in the idea of being declared innocent being declared 
not guilty, being vindicated, being declared in the right. And it gets very confusing at certain some New Testament passages because the word justification and justify is used alongside the word righteous and you end up thinking it's kind of talking about two different things. And if you're like me, as I was for many, most of my adult life, you just end up actually skipping over all those places because <laughs> they're just like you know you try to tease them apart and you make trying to make sense of it and you go oh my gosh what the heck is going on here and then you'd read a commentary or two about it and they weren't always helpful but i found a very tiny book on the apostle paul by a new testament scholar named e.p sanders many years ago and he had a chapter on what we're about to talk about and it was like wow why didn't anybody ever tell me this so, here is the problem. So, the, the top lines are about the word righteousness. We have the same problem when it comes to the word faith. In the Greek, the word righteousness is dikaiosune. Dixos, dikaiosun, various forms of it, just like we have various forms of our English words, right? A noun form, an adjective form, a verb form. Same thing for the word pistis in the Greek. If you look down that Greek column, which is pistis is the word faith. So there's a noun, pistis. There's the adjective, pistos. There's the verb, but I'm not sure how to pronounce it, pistotine, something like that. But there's a noun, adjective, verb for the word faith in Greek, just like there's a noun, adjective, verb for the word righteousness in Greek. However, in the Anglo-Saxon lang languages from which English is derived we have the word we have the noun righteousness we have the adjective righteous but we have lost the verb form so nobody says to themselves or to anybody else gosh i was righteous yesterday look at him he's righteous to him right now or i'm going to be righteous to tomorrow nobody we've lost it we've just lost the verb form of the word righteous or righteousness and it's a big shame because what we've done in English is we are now using the French origin for it which is the word justify and so boom you can talk about righteousness and justification alongside each other and not realize you're talking about the same thing because we, it would be great if we published Bibles which got rid of the word justify and justification and simply used righteous as a verb as weird as it would seem, which we're going to do in a moment. So look at the bottom lines. The same thing with the word faith. Okay? The word faith comes to us from the French, and we have the noun faith and the adjective faithful, but we have lost the verb form of the word faith. It's just gone. It's not in English anymore. I don't know where it went, but it went somewhere. So nobody says, I faithed yesterday. I'm, I'm faithing right now. I'm going to faith tomorrow. Nobody says that. Instead, we reach into the Anglo-Saxon language, we pick up the word belief, and we use it instead. So... We talk about, I believed yesterday, I'm believing now, I'm going to believe tomorrow. And as I've said many times, the regrettable part of that is that we, and belief is a word for most people that is an intellectual word. It's a word of the mind. It's a word about things you agree with, like uh, assenting to a, to a set of doctrines. The word faith, on the other hand, is a heart word. It's about trusting somebody, putting your faith in someone. So there are the, these are two big problems, I think, when it comes to for people really understanding their New Testament, which we all read in English. Okay? So today my focus is not on the word faith. Maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that more some other day. But right now it's on the word righteous. So, my friends, here is a passage from Galatians 3, verses 6 to 7, and I'm 
putting my, I'm going to leave this up here for a minute, and let's read it through. The top bullet is how it would be, how it is in your Bible. I don't even know which translation this is, doesn't matter. Galatians 3, 6, and 7. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, so you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. But if we actually did this the way it ought to be, closer to the Greek, it would read like this. Just as Abraham faithed in God, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So you see, those who faith are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would righteous the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who faith are blessed with Abraham who faith. And you come to understand that this whole paragraph and others like it throughout your New Testament, there's only two ideas in mind. Faith and righteousness. Faith and righteousness. Not four ideas. Not faith, righteousness, justification, and belief. For most people who read this, they think there's four ideas involved here. I get that. I thought that for most of my adult life. There's not four ideas involved here. It's all about two ideas, faith and righteousness, whether it's a noun, an adjective, or a verb. It's faith and it's righteousness. And I'm just telling you, friends, if you could sort of take this in, and when you come to some part that you begin to find a lot of these righteousness and justification words, and you stop yourself and say, nope, I'm going to be willing to use righteous as a verb, I'm going to use faith as a verb, and you do it, it's going to make it all a lot clearer to you. It won't go in one eye and out the other. It will go in one eye and stick in your brain because it will make sense. It will make sense. So, okay. Any questions about all of that? <laughs> You're going, Scott. None that's coming. This is a language class. Yeah, it is a language class. You know, words matter. It's a word. We're doing a series on words. You know, we have to come to grips with the fact that we read our Bibles in English and they're not written in English. They're not even written in the King James English, <laughs> they're written in Greek and Hebrew. And, uh, you know, even if you have a little Greek, let's say you took a year of Greek somewhere, there's that, that's not enough to really translate it and deal with all of the issues that are there in the tough parts. The easy parts are fine, but they're tough places. I went, um, one time I went to a uh, six hour, six hour, let me say that again, six hour seminar on one phrase in the New Testament, pistis Christu, and should it be translated the faith, faith in Christ or the faith of Christ? And after six hours of debate, these were the top Paul scholars in the world today. Except for N.T. Wright. He was not there. He was the only one that was missing. They finished the day and they said, well, you know, we can't really even decide this on the basis of the grammar. It, it's kind of, kind of on the basis of theology. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you smart people. I guess I don't, I guess I'm not so dumb after all. So anyway... It, you know, they're just words that most people don't use in our daily language. Righteousness, justification, sanctification. The only one I could think is that, you know, I ever hear say in, in, our, in, in 2021 is his acts were justified. Right. Or something to that, you know. They're just words we don't use, you know. There's a TV show called that was on justified, called Justified. Yes. And coming from the French... The word justify in that context means what? That in the end, he was in the right. He was in the right. Because mm -hmm. justify is really, underneath it, really is getting at the idea of righteousness. Yeah, right. Doing what is right. Doing what is just. 
So when we say somebody's justified in their actions, we're saying those actions were right. Yep. So, I don't know. Yep. It's, the Bible has a lot of words and ideas that you don't run into in the secular world so much. Right. Right, and so, but we have to learn them, and we have to, we can't, we, we, and why is that? Because the Bible, the Bible inhabits a different mindset than the world at large does. I, I picked up my Wall Street Journal from yesterday, and it had, you know, it had it had interviewed a number of people about what they had learned in the pandemic, and then that was kicked off the review section of the paper. And I was disappointed because they didn't have one person, not one person, who talked about the pan how the pandemic changed them in respect to their faith. I wouldn't have cared whether they were Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever. Not one person. And I thought to myself, well, golly, it just, it, again, faith is being shoved in out of the public square. And it's just it's just not how people's brains operate anymore. Maybe nobody at the journal even thought that they should have somebody in there reflecting on how the pandemic and the lockdown and the year apart from another possibly influenced their faith. So anyway, my soapbox. I have a lot of soapboxes I stand on. Okay, so <laughs> One more, one more place. This is one of the most. I mean, how can I put this? Scholars dig into certain places in particular in the Bible. This is one that has been dug into in a greater extent than almost any. Romans chapter three, verse twenty-one to twenty-four. And it's. I just want you to see this righteousness stuff at work again. It's clearer if you read it like this, and I bolded the, the little double places. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God, the covenant faithfulness of God, the promise-keeping of God has been disclosed, and it's attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who faith. That's the way to read it. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now righteous by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the way to read this. It's about faith, it's about righteousness. We are righteous by faith. We are saved by faith. We are declared not guilty by faith. We are declared, we are vindicated by, by faith. We first by the faith of Jesus Christ, which becomes effective through our faith. So my friends, there we go. Um, wow. I'm thinking maybe next week you should take on a really easy subject <laughs> like, um, I'm, I don't know, maybe helping us define Trinity or something like okay. that. Okay, we'll talk about that next week. So that'll be easy. I only got about eight books up there uh, on yes, I the know. Trinity. So. I know. Wow, because this, this is like some heavy stuff. And yes. bless all of you who have stayed with this class for the whole hour. Is anybody still online? They are. They are. They all understand that this matters. It, it does. When I know it does. It does. Course. See, I'm we need we need matters. to read our New Testaments well. You need to read it well because there is so much crap spread around out there in the world about the Bible and reading it and God and everything. Just how do you how do you make your way through that jungle? By reading your Bible well. That's how. Okay. Now we're going to talk. Well, do I have a minute? i got a few minutes. A minute or two. Yeah. Let's, let's get into the atonement. Right? Um, atone and atonement. And if you spend much time around, you know that the atonement is tied to the cross. Okay? It's tied to the cross. And 
the way to understand the word atonement or to say that Christ atoned for our sins is to take that word atonement and realize that it is at one. There's a little trick. At one. The at one minute. How is it we are put at one with God? Right? Because we're a sinful people. There's a lot that goes on in this world every day in our lives that God is deservedly, you know, angry about that separates us from God how is it we are put one with God how we all will say you know think of all the phrases you've heard I've been washed in the blood of the lamb you know been saved by Jesus been saved by the cross how is it that Jesus's death on a on a Roman cross in 30 AD has put us right with God how is that that this man, crucified by the Romans, as many, many, many were, how is it that his death on a cross puts us right with God? And in your New Testament, you would wish there was a nice, neat little paragraph that you could go to that would explain it to you, a nice, neat little explanation of the atonement, the at one how it is the cross puts us together, puts us right with God but you don't find it. It isn't there. The New Testament does not offer us one, typically referred to as one theory of the atonement. Rather, the New Testament offers us, depending on how you count them, six, seven, eight different images of atonement. Um, of how it is, how it is that this death on the cross puts us, puts us right with God. Um, one, of, one of the books I've used for a long time is because it's just so neat and orderly and organized is by a man named Alan Coppage who, who went through scripture and he found eight portraits of God and all eight portraits in the scripture are drawn for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And each one, each one really offers a little different view of the atonement. So, for example, and maybe we'll close here. I'll just throw out a few examples. Okay. We all know that Jesus is the good shepherd. So what image of a good shepherd do we use when we talk about salvation or when we talk about the atonement that image is being found like the sheep remember the parable about the lost sheep mm -hmm. how the shepherd will leave the 99 and go and look for the one right mm -hmm. so being found by our shepherd is a way to talk about salvation, to talk about the cross, to talk about what God has done. It's a very helpful image because it gets the emphasis away from what we have done onto what God has done. Because in that image, do the, does the lost sheep find the shepherd? No. The shepherd finds the sheep. Do we find God? Not the best way to think about it. You may feel like you're experiencing that, but a healthier way, theologically, is to understand that you have been found by the shepherd. I, what I experienced what in my late 40s was this sort of life-changing, you know, transformation. And I could talk about it in the sense of, well, I really found God when I was, that's the way people do it, you know? And no, that's not the way to do it. That's not the way to talk about it. If you hear me talk about it, what I say is, because I think this is a more biblical way, that when I was 48, God grabbed me 
and God grabbed me hard, and I wish God had grabbed me earlier. I don't understand why God waited so long to grab me, but yes, God grabbed me because it puts the emphasis on what God has done. It puts the emphasis on the working of God's grace in my life rather than me coming to some sort of you know, well-deserved spiritual awakening that I had been working toward. Then it's all about me. I'll, um, uh, right? So if you heard Arthur today, Arthur talking about how our souls are curved in upon ourselves in Augustine to where they just, all they see is me. That's, that is our natural state. We're, you know, it's easy to be very self, uh, self-absorbed. It's easy to think, hey, I found God, baby. I found Jesus last night. No, 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 no. God found you, buddy. God found you. So, um, another, so one is Good Shepherd. Um, my brain isn't operating to, I have notes I make to myself about these things. I don't even. And then I can't even find them. So, um, if God, if 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 God, is, another portrait of God obviously is king. So if God is the king, then what is the image of salvation or atonement that goes with that? Then it's a pardon, which is another image in the New Testament. God has pardoned our sins. That's what kings do. So you see, um, that's why you have to resist coming to just one, having one idea about what has happened on the cross. Because if you have just one idea that that's the only way to understand what happened on the cross, you're cutting out most of the New Testament. Because the New Testament wants to keep offering you these images because none of them is complete. So, anyway. The prodigal son would also be one too, right? Yeah, see, because, okay, so there's another one. So that image is God is Father. Right, which is another dominant image in Scripture, and what the prodigal son is a perfect example of the father welcoming and grabbing that son home. So, if your only idea of what happens happening on the cross is what would happen in a courtroom, you're not going to see that story the way that you should. So, anyway, that's it for this week. Next week is Palm Sunday. We'll see the kids, right? We'll see the kids. I know they won't. I don't think they'll be. They won't be in the building. But I'm. I will, they'll be waving palms. I think on the screen. Gosh, I'm looking forward to having an in-person Palm Sunday again because I love seeing the kids okay. parade around the sanctuary and everything. So, yeah. but I guess that's going to have to wait until 2022. Two. <laughs> so. What is amazing is that a lot of the little kids, I mean, they're back in the preschool every single day at St. Andrew. Preschool's been operating pretty much all year. All year. So, um, you know, it's St. Andrew really, they took lots of precautions in everything regarding COVID. They, the staff, they did such a great job. Kay Richardson has to get like a triple A. They knew that if they took, the data said if they took precautions, they could open schools. Catholic schools have been open across yes. america and church for all year it, you know meeting yes. in church and just taking precautions you know we heard some nightmares about other churches who did things a little sloppy and you know ended up with big messes so yep anyway thank you guys for hanging in there with us and some of those big words they just are they're big and they are they're big they're challenging they are they are and um i think if you continue a little bit next week on atonement as we're talking about Jesus on the cross, that would you know, be good. that'd be really great. Well, we just touched on it today. Yes, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm gonna take a sip of your water, sorry. So anyway, again, thanks for joining us. We love you guys. We miss you guys. But it is really I mean we could actually see ourselves now. I mean it's coming. It's, it's coming. It's coming. So it's coming. So, so we're excited about that. Yep. And um just excited. Get your what shots. Please. Get your shots. Yes, if you have to try to get your shots. Get your shots. And anyway, so okay, here we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful day, and we thank you for this group of just wonderful friends that have been with us, many of them for many, many years. And really, Lord, this last year, even though we have been separated physically, it seems like in a lot of ways we've become closer because of that. 
and we we do gather and we do study your word lord every single week and it is something that binds this group together in a way that no other activity could and we are so grateful for that lord we are so grateful also that many many of our friends and um, people in our congregation have gotten their shots have gotten double shots or are on their way to get their second shot and it's just going to open up a whole new world to so many of us and that's going to be just a wonderful thing we pray today god for both arthur and robert as both of them are going to start on a new path we know that the official date is not till july but we pray god that you would just be with both of them god as this is a, a whole new life phase for for both of these individuals we love robert we could not have been blessed with a better senior pastor all these years he's just one of the most incredible kindest man men that many of us have ever known and we're so grateful for arthur and we've got to see him grow through the past 10 years lord and um i know scott and i have been praying god to please you know please put the right person in our church and lord we really feel like this is an answer to prayer we are so grateful for arthur and his family and um, we we just pray, God, you will help St. Andrew continue to grow for the next 25 or 30 years through Arthur's uh, senior pastoralship. So hold us close, Lord. You know, with a group are as big as us, all of us have little joys and concerns on our hearts. We lift them up to you, God, through your Holy Spirit today. We pray, God, that you would hold us close and that we would feel your presence this week. All this, Lord, we lift up and we pray in the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Bye Adios, friends. everybody. Love, Love you guys. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Bye-bye.